This talk from Ralph Blumenthal was delivered in December of 2022 in New York City at an inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon. We've recently announced the next conference event in this series, which will be happening on Saturday, April 8th, 2023 in New York City and online. We'll be joined by Leslie Kane, Ryan Graves, Derek Pitts, James Fox, Elizabeth Crone, Peter Lavenda, and Dr. Daniel Ingram. Hosted by Leslie Kane, James Iandoli, and me, J. Christopher King. Tickets to join us live or online are now available at aninquiry2023.rsvpfi.com, but they're going fast. That link is down in the show notes and also in the comments. We're looking forward to the upcoming conference, and we hope to see you there. If you like this video, you can subscribe to our channel for more great content in the days ahead. And now, we bring you Kelly Chase and Ralph Blumenthal. Hi, everyone. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here today. I believe that what we're doing here is of critical importance. By coming together to form a community and a coalition around a more sober academic approach to the phenomenon, we are carving out an essential space for the exploration of realities that our current cultural paradigm has become blind to. And I'd especially like to thank our speakers for being here and lending their voices, their expertise, and for being willing to step into the fray on a topic that is often met with snickers and derision. Thank you for everything that you have done and continue to do to move this topic forward. And what I find most remarkable about, remarkable about this gathering today is that each of these speakers represents the best and brightest of their respective fields. And although they come from a variety of different backgrounds, and although each of them approaches the phenomenon from a different angle, each of them have come here to say some version of the same thing, which is this. Something significant about the nature of our reality is not as we have been told. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. It's been a hundred years since we discovered quantum mechanics and the baffling reality that the mere act of observing an event can change its outcome. We have decades of hard data telling us that psi phenomena ranging from precognition to telepathy isn't just real, but it appears to be a latent ability that most people have, at least to some degree. And over the last five years, we have whistleblowers at the highest levels of our government stepping forward to say that UFOs are real and that they exhibit a level of technology that breaks every paradigm that we have. It's no wonder the consensus reality is fraying at the edges. How many impossible things need to be proven true for us to be willing to humble ourselves and admit that the frameworks that we use to assess what is possible and what is not might be fundamentally flawed in some way that we haven't yet considered? The problem is that our modern world does not equip people to grapple with those things that lie outside of the realm of our current understanding. Ontologically speaking, the last couple of centuries have been defined by a long, slow slide down a slippery slope that started with a very reasonable and rational idea that science should concern itself primarily with what can be measured, to the absurd and epistemologically crippling idea that anything that can't be measured can be said, definitively and scientifically, to not exist. We as a species find ourselves in quite a pickle. Entire swaths of the human experience, and seemingly critical ones at that, have been deemed to be impossible. And so where does that leave us when impossible things happen? For many of us, it leaves us trapped in a postmodern hellscape where we can't trust ourselves. We can't trust others. We can't even trust the eyewitness accounts of top Navy pilots, even when those accounts are verified by multiple weapon systems on the most advanced aircraft carriers in the world. So where does one find a logical foothold in such a place? What can be known when no one can be trusted to accurately perceive, much less report, their experience? The fear among the skeptics seems to be that what we're calling for is a complete abandonment of reason. But what we're advocating for isn't the death of reason, but rather for the resurrection and reintegration of meaning. We're asking for the development of new paradigms that acknowledge and make space for the fullness of human experience. And instead of conveniently relegating what we can't explain to the realm of non-existence, we're advocating for a sober, rigorous, and scientific exploration of the impossible things that somehow keep happening. And what could be more reasonable than that? And our next speaker has fearlessly been leading the charge for greater transparency and deeper understanding around the UFO and related phenomena. Award-winning journalist Ralph Blumenthal 
was a staff reporter at the New York Times from 1964 to 2009. He led the Times Metro team that won the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage of the 1993 truck bombing at the World Trade Center. And in 2017, she was part of the team, along with another of our esteemed speakers, Leslie Keen, that broke the story in the New York Times about the Pentagon's secret UFO program. He is the author of several books, including The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. In short, we're very lucky to have him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ralph Blumenthal to the stage. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Jay, for inviting me. Thanks to fellow panelists and all of you for coming out, everybody online. Uh, here's a rare photo of John Mack and Leslie Kane with aliens. Unretouched photo. Pictures don't lie. Um, at the uh, Lachlan, Nevada UFO conference in 2002, uh, and this, what, what this proves indubitably, of course, is that John Mack had a sense of humor. Um, he also collected UFO cartoons. Now, John Mack, of course, uh, is the Harvard psychiatrist uh, who risked his eminent career to investigate alien abduction um, and um, a whole series of anomalies, including life after death. Um, and I'm sure John needs no introduction here. Um, now, my book, uh, The Believer, is the story of, of John Mack and his struggles with Harvard to get the truth out. Um, and um, by the way, I will explain at the end that I don't use the term the believer pejoratively. Um, I'll explain why. Um, and finally, shamelessly self-promoting, uh, this is my next book with my wife. Uh, it's a children's picture book, a nonfiction, strictly factual, uh, and UFOs coming out in April by a wonderful illustrator. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it'll be avail it's available for pre-order, actually. Um, that's the end of the self-promotion. Um, okay, and, and the end of the slides, thankfully. Uh, okay, so... Um, I'm calling this uh, little talk The Abduction of John Mack, um, A Hero's Journey into the Heart of Cosmic Darkness. Now, abduction uh, in this telling is in quotes because it's uh, metaphorical. John, as you probably know, was never abducted or even ever saw a UFO, and neither, by the way, have I. Um, and John Mack came to reflect that this was probably all to the good because it left him pure to conduct his research without um, any bias. And, um, and I could say the same thing, actually. Um, now, uh, John was struck by this uh, phenomenon, um, and as he told the reporter for Psychology Today, um, it's the, you know, of course uh, he was struck by it. It, was the, it. it is and it was and is remains uh, the most fascinating puzzle in the cosmos. So uh, I got inspiration for my talk uh, from a, a statement I use as the epigram of my book, and you'll probably recognize his name from um, uh, Jeff's talk, uh, Sir William Crookes, um, a renowned English scientist of the 1870s in England, um, who was sent by skeptical fellow scientists to debunk uh, all kinds of anomalous things that were going on, including levitation and um, you know, weird things that they couldn't explain. And uh, Crooks w uh, witnessed these things and came away a believer. Uh, he was astounded at what he had seen, and uh, people levitating, uh, musical instruments playing themselves in a locked cabinet. And uh, he said afterwards, uh, I never said it was possible. I only said it was true. Uh, and I love that. And I, I take it really as a kind of a shorthand for the field we're discussing today. Uh, impossible yet true. We're up against a great mystery. It was not solved by John Mack or anyone else I know of. Um, and um, as the renowned chronicler of anomalies, uh, Charles F uh, Fort, uh, said, it's like looking for a needle no one ever lost in a haystack that never was. 
<laughs> to give you some idea of what we're up against. Um, and, uh, and also, um, um, Jeff mentioned Jacques Vallée, who described himself as the only ufologist who doesn't know what UFOs are. Um, and I'm, I'm with him. Um, so we have to maintain our humility. But at least the Pentagon now admits that these things are real. They're physical objects um, that might threaten our military and civilian aircraft with near misses. Um, and that's about all we know so far. But it's progress from the days when the government, of course, denied uh, the existence of these altogether and described them as fly specks on the windshield or uh, swamp gas, <laughs> uh, infamously uh, uh, hallucinogenic uh, 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 you know, n non-reality things. Um, but the phenomenon remains as mysterious as death, as Whitley knows. And um, you'll hear more about that also from my colleague, Leslie. Um, so John Mack's death is sort of where my story begins. Uh, in 2004, I was the New York Times correspondent in Texas when I happened to pick up a, a used book uh, called A Passport to the Cosmos. Now, this was John Mack's second book, a more careful and altogether better, as he himself said, than his first book, um, uh, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens, which was a little too breathless and a little too uh, credulous. Um, and, that, and, and it got him into trouble with Harvard, as I'll get to. Um, anyway, I read Passport in 2004, and I was frankly blown away. thought it was extraordinary that there was a Harvard psychiatrist who clearly believed in the reality of UFOs and alien beings um, based on what people he was treating or talking to was telling him, and I thought he'd make a great story for the Times. Um, and I had no idea, by the way, that he was already so famous. He'd already been in the Times, uh, written up many times, and he'd been on Oprah. They've been on a lot of TV shows, uh, but something I didn't know uh, at all. And um, I thought, I very naively, I'd give him a call and uh, set up an interview. Um, and uh, I picked up the paper a few days later to see he'd been run over and killed in London. Um, he'd gone to celebrate the 30th anniversary of his Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Lawrence of Arabia. And like many Americans, he got out of the uh, underground station at night, looked the wrong way, uh, like many Yanks do in London, and got run over by a drunk driver. Um, now, when I got out over my shock, uh, I reached out to his family, I tracked them down, and asked whether I could get uh, his archives, access to his archives. And um, uh, eventually, after a period of grieving, uh, they agreed, and I did get access to his vast and voluminous archive, including... Uh, private journals, which he kept, um, unpublished manuscripts, patient accounts, um, and recordings of his own therapy sessions, because as a psychiatrist, he had to um, have be, be analyzed himself. And he, great saver that he was, he recorded these uh, with a guru, and uh, they fell into my uh, possession as well. So John, I found, was um, a, an unlikely pursuer of the weird anomalies he stumbled across, um, as, as was I. I mean, I grew up uh, reading science fiction, as many uh, young people did in days uh, after the war, and um, Ray, Bra Ray, Bra Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, the great masters. Um, but then I decided to study art and journalism and uh, uh, went on to a career at the New York Times where I covered uh, Nazi war criminals and uh, uh, corrupt politicians, maybe that's a tautology, um, uh, <laughs> um, nothing to do with uh, UFOs and aliens, um, until I stumbled across uh, John Mack's Passport to the Cosmos. So by, ne by 2010, I had retired from the Times staff. I was working on my book on John when I took a summer job teaching journalism um, to international high school students at Phillips Exeter Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire. Now, uh, Exeter, you probably all know, is a sainted place in UFO history, um, ground zero of the celebrated 1965 incident at Exeter, and I trace that story in my book, um, going back to the, the backdrop when pilot um, Ken Arnold spotted so-called flying saucers uh, over Mount Washington, um, 
back in 1947 and followed very quickly by the crash of something uh, at, at Roswell. Um, first, the military called it a flying disc, famously. Uh, then it was a, a, a balloon, a weather balloon. Uh, and But a flurry of other sightings followed and um, uh, studied by the Air Force, which then covered up its investigations uh, with lies and misinformation. Uh, then in 1965, a fellow named John Grant Fuller, um, a Broadway playwright and columnist for the Saturday Review, um, learned of uh, the incident at Exeter. Norman Muscarello, an 18-year-old kid, had seen these uh, UFOs um, uh, hitchhiking home on Route 150 uh, one night. And uh, it was a route, by the way, that I had come to know very well outside Exeter because I rode my bike there. And there's high-tension wires where these UFOs were uh, flocking around. Um, so um, two policemen who were summoned by Norman Muscarella's story uh, then saw these UFOs, and um, so did lots of other witnesses. And um, um, Fuller then learned of the story of Betty and Barney Hill, um, who uh, had a very strange uh, abduction encounter in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Um, and the story didn't break until the encounter happened in 1961, but the story didn't break really until 1965. Um, and John Grant Fuller put them both out, the incident at Exeter and the uh, Betty and Barney Hill Interrupted Journey um, as a book in 1965, and that made history. Now, John Mack didn't care about any of this because back then he was studying T.E. Lawrence um, and working on his psychiatry at, at Harvard and um, doing various very good social projects uh, bringing social services and mental health services to underserved areas around Boston, and he couldn't care less about UFOs. So my book takes up the story really starting in 1990 um, when John Mack learned of the encounters from uh, Bud Hopkins uh, and with his, expert, with his expertise as a psychiatrist, um, soon ruled out all the, simple, the facile explanations that were being given um, for these experiences. Um, they were not, he quickly determined from his endpoint as a prize-winning psychiatrist, uh, they were not hallucinations, they were not mental illness, um, they were certainly not fabrications and hoaxes. Uh, the people were too uh, upset in the recounting of these uh, to, to be made up, he quickly determined. Um, and unless two-year-old kids, for example, could make up stories based on the books they had read and the films they'd seen, uh, John decided that these were, whatever the reality of these experiences were, they were not uh, deliberate fabrications. Um, now, as I said, uh, John Mack didn't start off interested in UFOs and aliens. His father, Edward Mack, uh, was a well-known English professor at City College of New York, uh, where I was a student uh, back when he was a professor there. Uh, I didn't know who he was. I knew his name, um, but it's really one of the many interesting synchronicities I came across uh, in writing my book. Um, on his father's side, uh, John um, uh, descended from a pioneering ophthalmologist and noted cancer specialist and one of the first Jewish academicians at Harvard. Uh, on his mother's side, uh, he came from a family of German brewers who developed Rheingold beer. Um, and growing up, I used to look at the posters of the election for Miss Rheingold uh, and all these gorgeous young women and wished I was old enough to, to vote, um, among other things. Uh, so, and, and you know, I, came, I started coming across all these synchronicities, interestingly enough. Um, I was searching as I was writing my book for a cousin of, of John Max, who was the last ruler of Rheingold, a man named Terry Liebman, Liebman being the family name of the Rheingold brewing uh, brewers, um, I looked all over for him, and I finally found him living across the street from me in Manhattan. Um, it was just a number of very strange things. So John Mack came from a wealthy family. His father's mother had inherited millions, and uh, his father, Edward Mack, grew up in what became the uh, opulent Sherry Netherland on Central Park. Um, and uh, Edward Mack attended Exeter, Exeter's sister school, Andover, uh, and married Eleanor Liebman of the Rheingold Brewing family, and she gave birth to John Mack uh, 
in September 1929, um, just as the stock market crash was triggering the Great Depression. Um, not that it really hurt the family much because uh, they somehow had enough outside investments, so they came through pretty much all right. Um, but Eleanor died of appendicitis at 25, John's mother, uh, when John was just eight and a half months. And penicillin had just been discovered uh, or developed, but uh, was not yet in, in common use, so it didn't help her. And uh, that became a very important part of the story, I found, because John was always searching for his birth mother. Uh, he always felt he'd been separated from <clears throat> this vital force in his life, and, um, and that perhaps explains some of his a search for the missing in the cosmos, and that's just not my analysis, but his own. Uh, he realized that as a, as a psychiatrist. Um, and he was, in fact, uh, tormented by his mother's death all his life. Um, as he repeatedly told his therapist in the notes that I got and the recordings, and thank God he was a good saver. Now, uh, after Eleanor's death, uh, John Mack's father remarried. Uh, he, made, he remarried another socialite. You could analyze that a bit, I suppose. Um, her, her name was Ruth Prince Gimble. She was the widow of a great-grandson of the uh, founder of the Gimble's department store chain. And as the Great Depression uh, hit or worsened in 1930, uh, Adam Gimble jumped out of a window at the Yale Club uh, near Grand Central. And the distraught widow, Ruth, Ruth Gimble, soon met the grieving widower, Edward Mack, and suddenly they were married and John Mack had a stepmother. And uh, since Ruth had a, a, a daughter a little older than baby John, he had a stepsister as well. Um, Again, this went into his psychological development and gave him uh, a lot to work with, shall we say. Um, and I had another interesting synchronicity uh, in the course of, of my research uh, because I was working, uh, and I'm still working, at Baruch College in the, uh, in the archives, and I came across a set of Ruth Max papers. She was a well-known New Deal economist, and somehow... Uh, a batch of her papers, a file turned up at Baruch College where I was archiving all these uh, files. So the, the Mac story sort of kept following me. Uh, so John Mack, very charismatic, cobalt-eyed, devilishly handsome, as well as confident, impetuous, and intellectually brilliant, um, grew up in, a, in this conventional, uh, secular German-Jewish household, it was not a spiritual family at all. Uh, he remembers growing up listening to his father read the Bible, but it was uh, as literature, not as the literal word of God. Um, and he grew up with a strong social conscience. Uh, he developed mental health services for the poor in Cambridge, which was then a very downtrodden part of Boston. And, um, and one night, like, like many of us, um, he went to the movies to see this new, long, sensational movie called Lawrence of Arabia, he went with his wife, Sally, who was then pregnant with their first boy. And um, uh, we all went to see the movie, or many of us, and came, back, came out saying, wow, it was a long movie, but it was a great movie. Uh, won all kinds of prizes later. But John Mack came out determined to investigate the story of, of T.E. Lawrence. Um, and uh, Lawrence, being a very enigmatic personality who fomented the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Turks, and um, and John Mack thought he was a he made a fascinating psychological study, which he did, uh, complete with sadomasochism and uh, being whipped and all kinds of things that um, he ended up uh, writing in his book uh, *Prince of Our Disorder*, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize, as I said, in 1977 for biography. So that suddenly made John Mack um, an expert on the Middle East. Um, and he was called to, for many speeches and talks, and um, he got drawn into the uh, efforts to secure peace between the Arabs and Israelis. And it's kind of a laughable um, segment in my book where he meets Yasser Arafat, uh, and they try to hammer out a peace. And Arafat, being uh, this you know diehard revolutionary uh, devoted to the overthrow of, of Israel, and Mac being a, a, a very... Um, pro-Israeli Jew, um, it, it was a, a kind of a funny uh, meeting that they had, and I lay it out in my book. Um, 
and it propelled him into many other activist causes, including uh, a campaigning against nuclear weapons. A big uh, opponent of uh, atomic weapons and uh, uh, part of his uh, efforts to you know, secure peace in the world. Um, so at one point, John and his wife Sally, and then their three boys, who were then uh, young men, uh, went to um, um, Nevada to um, uh, oppose the nuclear tests uh, to bear witness against the nuclear tests that were going on at the you know atomic test site, and they deliberately got themselves arrested uh, for overstepping the line. He was always pushing the boundaries. Um, and that, and I'll sort of telescope the story here, led him um, soon after to Esalen, that, you know, think tank on the Pacific, that very strange place. Um, and um, he uh, got, got involved with uh, experiments into altered states of consciousness um, through a breathing discipline called holotropic breath work. Uh, this was the work of a, of a Czech psychiatrist named Stan Groff, um, who had emigrated to America and began experimenting with LSD, um, and which Mac would also try, by the way, along with other hallucinogens, including ayahuasca and um, marijuana and anything he could get his hands on because he was interested in the effects on his brain. <laughs> um, now, um, in addition to uh, LSD, Groff found that a regulated breathing um, without drugs um, also uh, uh, propelled people into altered states of consciousness. Uh, and when John heard that, uh, he had to try it because he was always interested in trying new things. And um, so he went to uh, one of these holotropic breathwork sessions in, uh, on the West Coast, and the first time nothing happened. And um, he thought that that was it. He wasn't susceptible or whatever. And then suddenly... Uh, he found himself in the womb, uh, participating in his mother's struggle to give birth to him, as he recalled it. And then she was turning blue, and he began to uh, have all kinds of uh, associations with the blue fairy of Pinocchio, very strange stuff. And then um, it got stranger. Uh, he felt himself in medieval Russia uh, watching his son. Uh, this isn't not literal, but th this was his in his imagination, watching his son get decapitated by a Mongol warrior. So he was wondering, well, well, had he tuned into a past life? I mean, was this his story? Or did it just show, which he eventually began to believe, that consciousness was something fluid and could travel? Um, so Stan Groff was the first one to introduce John Mack to UFOs. Um, it, uh, Groff gave Mac an advanced chapter in a book called Spiritual Emergency by Keith Thompson, um, who was a brilliant analyst and parapsychologist. Um, and it examined abduction accounts, but not from the literal truth, but whether they might be mythical uh, bridges to a momentous cosmic shift uh, to a future of greater spirituality. So um, uh, Thompson was one of those who said, it doesn't matter what the truth is. What is the effect of these stories? Uh, but John was gripped by the idea, well, are these stories true or not? You know, um, And uh, were people really getting abducted by aliens? And he doubted it because he didn't see any evidence of it. Um, and later, Mac credited Groff with uh, in changing his life, really, introducing him to the subject. And, and he said... Um, uh, Groff and his wife, who worked with Stan, uh, they opened up my they opened up my psyche, and the UFOs flew in. <laughs> I like that. So Mac had another fateful encounter um, um, at one of the Esalen functions at one of Groff's um, uh, uh, programs or sessions. He met a fellow psychologist uh, named Blanche Chavusti. Uh, who was working with a patient who had dreams that Chavosti thought might be masking uh, abduction experience. And Chavosti happened to be, I found out later, a very interesting character who believed she was a victim of mind control, mind control experiments of the CIA. Um, and it turned out that uh, everything you heard about the CIA in this case was true. It sounds like, uh, um, you know, made up stories of the evil CIA, but they really were giving 
uh, hallucinogenic drugs to innocent people and then driving them insane and then tracking the results to see what, how the drugs could be used in wartime, etc. Anyway, so Shabasti thought she was one of these victims. I don't know whether um, that was ever confirmed. But anyway, she um, told Mac about her experiences with this patient who had abduction-type experiences. And then she said she had a friend named Bud Hopkins um, who was working in New York, and would, would Mac like to meet him? And Mac said, thought that was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. Uh, why would he want to meet somebody who believes that people are getting abducted by aliens? Um, it was totally crazy. So he said no. So then came one of those strange things that happens in life that, that turns your story around. Uh, and you don't know exactly why or how. Um, and John was in New York visiting his good friend, um, Robert Lifton, the, the Harvard psychiatrist who had written um, prize-winning books on Nazi doctors and the aftermath of the uh, atomic bombings in Japan, um, eminent psychiatrist in his own right. And um, uh, he, so Mac was visiting him in New York, and uh, it turned out that um, Lifton uh, had, a, had a vacation home in uh, Cape Cod in Wellfleet, uh, near where Bud Hopkins had a, an art studio. And uh, uh, so they knew each other. And um, you know, psychiatrists like to vacation on Cape Cod, which is why you can't get analyzed in August. So, um, so it suddenly it popped into John's head, after all, to maybe give Bud Hopkins a call. And he afterwards he couldn't ex ex explain why uh, he had this thought. But anyway, uh, he asked. He he knew that Bud Ho that uh, Lifton, who he was visiting, knew Bud Hopkins, and he said, "Well, maybe Lifton would like to come along." And at this point, um, uh, Lifton's wife, BJ, spoke up and said, uh, no, she told Mac, uh, Bob has a choice about getting involved in this and you don't. So I found that story, which I think I heard from Lifton later, uh, extraordinary. I mean, uh, Lifton's wife, BJ, as kind of a Cassandra who saw the whole story before it, it happened. Um, so in... However, it happened in December 1990. John Mack went off to meet Bud Hopkins, uh, who was an accomplished painter and sculptor, um, and he'd been interested in UFOs since 1964. When on Cape Cod, he was driving, and he, he and a group of people in the car saw a UFO over the ocean, and um, they got to the party that they were heading to, and and Hopkins excitedly told all the people there, we just saw a UFO. And everybody at the party said, yeah, we know that. We've seen them too. So uh, that made him realize that th this was some kind of a strange phenomenon, and it got him interested in the subject. And um, uh, it so happened that one day back in New York, um, a Hopkins um, liquor store owner told him a really... Uh, striking story. This, the, the man, the store owner, said he was driving home to New Jersey one night uh, when he saw a, a big UFO trailing his car. And it's sort of trance-like, he followed this UFO over the, the, the George Washington Bridge uh, to New Jersey, uh, to North Hudson Park, which is sort of opposite the cloisters on the New Jersey side. And he saw the UFO land, he's telling Bud, and little creatures got out and started scooping up soil into pails and then taking off. Uh, he was completely freaked out, uh, and uh, Hopkins didn't know what to make of it, but he, he gathered his, uh, somebody else and went back to North Hudson Park to look for evidence. And uh, they, they found a window glass that seemed to have been broken by something, the UFO, presumably, and they found other witnesses and, and Bud wrote it up for the Village Voice, which was then in its heyday. And that put him on the UFO map. Uh, and Hopkins went on to create a group of experiencers, all with alien abduction stories. And he taught himself hypnosis, hypnosis so he could probe their memories. And uh, he was the first to popularize the idea of missing time with people who... Uh, arrived at their destinations late without an explanation of what had happened. Later, through hypnosis, recover um, memories of, of a UFO experience, explaining their delays. Uh, and, and Hopkins wrote that in his first book in 1981. So, um, so 
so when uh, when Mac arrived at uh, and and talked to, to Bud Hopkins at his townhouse in December 1990, Hopkins gave him a bunch of letters that had come into him from readers of his books, and um, he said. Hopkins said, in effect, to Mac, look, you're the psychiatrist. You, you tell me if these people are crazy. So Mac looked at the letters, and he couldn't believe the stories he was reading in these letters, and he decided to gather a group of experiencers, as he called them, a more neutral term than abductees, uh, for, for himself um, to, to investigate. Um, and that, of course, was at the peril of his reputation at Harvard. Um, so what intrigued John Mack? Uh, he quickly found, as a trained psychiatrist, that these people were not mentally ill. Um, they were not, you know, deranged in any way. They were not publicity seekers. Um, they were not uh, fabricators. Uh, something had really happened to them by the way they were telling him these stories. Their um, affect, as a psychiatrist would say, in, in recounting what had happened or what they remembered had happened was so authentic that he couldn't Imagine, as a trained psychiatrist, that this, this was suitable for people who were making up a story. Um, the stories were surprisingly consistent, uh, sometimes told by children as young as two years old who couldn't be quoting books or movies. Um, and there was some fragmentary evidence, like uh, marks on uh, outside where they saw the UFOs land, um, uh, trees that were had broken branches, uh, unexplained, unexplained body scars on some of these people. And these incidents didn't just happen at night in bed. Uh, they were not nightmares because John Mack knew about nightmares. He had written a celebrated textbook on nightmares. Um, so he knew that there was a difference between what these people were recounting and, and nightmares. And besides, they weren't only, only happening at night. Um, there was one woman he interviewed uh, who worked for the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration who was out in a snowmobile. Um, and um, she went missing for an hour and a half, and when they found her, uh, the snowmobile was flipped over, and her clothes were piled up. Her jacket and hat and a scarf and gloves were piled up neatly beside the snowmobile, and later she had uh, she recaptured memories of some kind of a, an alien encounter experience, abduction experience. So this core, so-called core abduction in, in narrative had people taken at all hours, beamed through solid walls, uh, witnesses switched off, pseudo-medical probes, reproductive procedures, sperm taken from men, eggs from women, uh, pregnancies removed, and sometimes these people uh, remembered being re-abducted to visit their offspring uh, later. Very strange story. Um, and the beings called greys were commonly described as a short, childlike creatures uh, of undiffer undifferentiated gender, with a pear-shaped head, rubbery skin, enormous black eyes, um, a nose, a, a holes, and a slits for a mouth. Um, and they often were what, wore what seemed like uniforms and walked with a strange bouncing gait. Um, and some people actually thought they were robots. Um, now, there were more human-looking figures called doctor types who seemed to be in charge of them, some people recounted. Um, and there seemed even to be some different races of aliens, including a warlike reptilian. And the ships were often described as uh, clammy, lit by a strange light, uh, with computer screens, minimal furniture, no bathrooms, visible, or kitchens. So um, Mac added a special dimension uh, to his interviews with uh, people recounting these stories, um, and he found that the encounters to them were not only terrifying, but also um, transformative. Um, these experiences often emerged with um, more a concern about the fate of the planet, um, uh, feelings of, of joy at meeting these beings, belief in a, a divinity, uh, a source, um, and um, and not all the experiences, by the way, matched exactly. Um, they were similar enough to be congruent, but different enough so that they weren't all uh, telling the same story as if they'd all agreed on on one one particular experience to tell. So that was another thing that gave Mac confidence that these stories were somehow genuine. Um, and some of the strangest aspects were things that were just too unfathomably weird 
to even ever be made up. Um, Kyron Austin, who worked with John uh, uh, at the end of his life, um, and uh, ha had a wonderful story she told me, and when I did a story on her and Jay um, about their experiences, how she uh, was a child and she had a bubble gum machine, and uh, somehow it disappeared. And later on, she found uh, the guy who uh, took the bubble gum machine from her, and he was. Uh, with her on a spaceship. And I mean, it just got so incredibly wild that she's even embarrassed to tell the story. And yet she tells it because she said, this, this is what happened to her. Um, now, strikingly, uh, Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, another researcher who worked uh, alongside John in many of the same, in, in the same field, uh, did not get the same transformative stories from their experiences. So uh, that suggested that either Mac was seeing something that others didn't see or he was injecting something that the others weren't injecting um, or somehow he was uh, putting that into these stories. Anyway, um, Mac studied dozens of these experiencers and um, after his efforts to publish in peer-reviewed journals were rebuffed, uh, he wrote two best-selling books. Uh, the first was Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens in 1994, uh, he went on Oprah with some of his experiences, and you can find that on the internet. It makes for a fascinating, uh, you know, forty minutes or so, um, and um, you can imagine how that went over at Harvard. Uh, um, he also, at the same time, traveled to India to meet with the Dalai Lama, uh, who was very interested in uh, abduction experiences. And uh, Mac was the only one who kept a transcript of these sessions, a week of uh, workshops with the Dalai Lama, and I had access to them for my book. And you, I don't think you'll find this account anywhere else. Um, <coughs> and Mac also spoke, he wasn't shy, he spoke at Harvard gatherings about these experiences, and uh, he co-sponsored a conference at MIT um, in... Um, um, I think of the year 1994 or five, I forget, um, that drew um, uh, all kinds of eminent scientists and psychologists and theologians uh, to MIT. MIT did not sponsor this conference, but they made a hall available because they thought it would look bad uh, if they try to censor this. Um, anyway, uh, this week's conference was astounding um, because um, it gave a forum to all these eminent scientists to... Uh, discuss what they had found or learned about this strange abduction experience and, and compare notes. And in the end, they put out a thick volume called Alien Discussions, which anyone can buy. Uh, it's about the size of a phone book, and it's fascinating because it's a transcript of this conference. Um, now, leaders uh, at, at Harvard, as I said, were predictably scandalized, um, and they thought maybe Mac was validating these experiences because other psychiatrists would not treat uh, or council experiencers, um, and Max said um, uh, he would have loved to find a good, to have found a good explanation, um, but he just couldn't. Uh, there, there wasn't one. Um, uh, so um, he said these things must have happened uh, on some level, and that's of course what got him into trouble at Harvard. Uh, Harvard launched a secret inquiry. Uh, under the longtime editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, a man called Arnold Relman, who died a few years ago, very eminent um, uh, uh, physician. And he, uh, in, in explaining to Mac what this committee was going to do, he used the word, unfortunately, inquisition. He said it was not an inquisition. <laughs> well, you can't tell a psychiatrist what something is not. <laughs> uh so Mac thought, why would he use that word if, if that wasn't what it was? So in my book, I call it an inquisition because it went into Mac's finances. It went into his beliefs. It was very intrusive. Um, and um, uh, it really tormented Mac. Uh, and Mac later reflected it. He called it a clash of worldviews. He and this committee were really coming from completely different places. And he wrote a book called When Worldviews Collide which I thought was a wonderful title off the old science fiction movie When Worlds Collide, but he never got it published. But I had access to it. So uh, Mac, very gullibly, began meeting with the Harvard Committee uh, without counsel. And then his uh, nephew, uh, 
when he heard this, said, you got to be, you have got to be crazy um, not to have a lawyer with you. So uh, the first lawyer Mac found was a lawyer who had connections to Harvard. So that didn't work out very well. But he then hired uh, a wonderful team, including um, uh, Danny Sheehan, a Jesuit who had investigated uh, the Iran-Contra arms scandal of the Reagan administration. He had investigated the Karen Silkwood a case that became a movie with Meryl Streep, the plutonium poisoning case. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, he had investigated the Ku Klux Klan. So he was a real firebrand. And as his co-counsel, Mac hired um, Eric McLeish, who was the son of the novelist uh, Rod McLeish and the, the, grand, the great nephew, grand nephew of Archibald McLeish, the poet, a very eminent guy, who was highlighted in the film Spotlight about the priest abuse scandal because he later, or almost at the same time he was working for Mac, he was investigating the stories of uh, uh, sexual assaults by uh, priests in Boston. So, um, so, so Mac had a great team, and uh, Harvard professor Alan Dershowitz uh, actually wrote an op-ed defending Mac. So he had a lot of powerful friends, and... Um, they all held Harvard's feet to the fire, and eventually Harvard capitulated, and um, uh, uh, nobody ever came out with a story of what uh, what this inquisition actually was. Harvard never uh, issued a full report on it, but I was able to piece it together from emails and the draft reports that I found in Mac's archive. So I like to say I have the only account of the Harvard inquisition on John Mac in my book. Um, so, uh, Mac went on to expand his interest in anomalies and the paranormal, and his one mistake he realized later was to see, um, alien abduction stories as something singular when actually it was part of a whole bunch of mysteries that seemed equally, uh, mysterious, um, ghost stories, animal mutilations, uh, ancient sightings of flying craft in ancient annals, Irish fairy stories, the old hag syndrome when people feel they're being suffocated by a foul-smelling creature at night, um, <clears throat> near-death experiences, and reincarnation. Um, and um, he was particularly intrigued with crop circles. Um, and he went to England in 2004 to uh, investigate tr- crop circles and found them very mysterious and full of some kind of strange power. So at the end of his life, and I'm coming to the end, um, Mac was researching a book on a gifted young um, psychiatrist named Elizabeth Targ, um, who had special intuitive powers, um, and uh, ended up, uh, in, she was investigating brain tumors uh, in her patients, and ended up dying of the same brain tumor she was investigating. And after, after she died at a young age, she somehow seemed able to communicate with her husband and family from from beyond. And uh, Mac was working on, by the way, she was the daughter of Russell Tog, who Jeff mentioned, who had the CIA contract to uh, investigate remote viewing. Um, um, anyway, um, so um, Mac was working on the book of uh, on, on Elizabeth Tog when he was run over in London and killed. And um, uh, it was inevitable that his death would um, trigger all kinds of conspiracy theories, particularly on the young internet at the time. And rumors spread that he was assassinated because of what he knew. And I did f- uh, find all the police files, and I came away completely satisfied and was able to report that there was nothing um, mysterious or untoward in his death. It was a tragic accident just the way it appeared. Um, but then uh, I go on to some other things at the end of the book, that uh, I didn't want to put in the main body of the book, but I thought were really interesting. Um, I tell the story of Barbara Lamb, uh, who was a well-known uh, psychotherapist and experiencer who had accompanied Mac on his uh, visit to the crop circles. She was on the trip. Um, and later, uh, after Mac's death, Lamb was visiting her daughter in California and with an allergy to her daughter's cat, uh, she had an a- asthma attack um, that left her struggling to breathe. She thought she was suffocating, uh, choking to death. And then she saw an image of Mac, and um, 
he was saying, don't worry, Barbara, you'll be okay. And she felt a healing ball of light enter her chest, and she suddenly could breathe. Now, uh, Lamb, who had intrigued me uh, with a story of meeting a reptilian in her living room one day, uh, and a very pleasant encounter, by the way, uh, also told me that uh, she and John were scheduled to deliver a paper at the Lachlan UFO conference on reptilians, and his death cut that short. And she didn't know what to do, whether she should still appear at the conference. Um, and um, he, John came to her in a dream, she told me, and said, by all means, she should still deliver his paper at the conference, and he told her where to find the paper. It was at home, on a certain bookshelf, uh, the, the bookshelf nearest this other room, sticking out certain papers, and um, she, uh, that Barbara should call Karen Austin, who was Max's assistant at the time, and describe just what John said where the papers were. So Barbara Lamb did that. Um, Karen located the papers. She delivered them to Barbara. Barbara delivered them at the conference and credited Mac <laughs> with uh, this report on reptilians. Um, another friend from the crop circle trip, Sean Randall, uh, told me she dreamed that Mac walked out of a crowd and said, come on, let's talk. Uh, they w then they were in a restaurant and Mac was sitting next to her on the banquette, and she turned to him and said, you know you're dead. And he said, yeah, of course. And um, as she told the story, Mac was wearing a short sleeve shirt, which he liked, he's kind of dorky in his uh, dress, and she was wearing a, a blouse with no sleeves, and their bare arms touched, and she felt tremendous heat coming off his body. And she turned to him crying, John, you're burning me. And he said, yeah, that's so you'll know I'm real. Uh, anyway, uh, I end my book with yet another strange story. Um, Max, a longtime uh, collaborator and social worker, Roberta Colasanti, uh, was doing a reading with a medium. The medium was Will Manet, who had developed psychic powers after nearly getting electrocuted as a child. He had climbed a tree and, and touched a high power line and fell down. It was nearly electrocuted. It melted his arm. And... Uh, Maybe in the falling, as he later said, he somehow uh, triggered a, um, a uh, process to restart his heart. I don't know. But anyway, he survived. And he survived with supernatural powers, um, as he described it. He wrote a book about it. And so he was sitting with uh, Roberto Colasanti, the medium. And at, at one point, he started laughing. And he said to Roberto, come on, Roberto, don't you know John is sitting here with us? And... Um, and he has a message for you. And he said, the message is, um, it was not what we thought. So Colasanti was stunned. I mean, what was not what they thought? But, you know, UFOs, aliens, but uh, it wasn't the kind of setup where she could ask him questions. Uh, that was all there was to the message. So she kept wondering about it, and four years later, her husband died. And um, this time, she said, another medium passed on a message from him after he died. Death is not what we think. So, she was left to wonder, is that what Mac had meant? Death? I mean, was there any way of knowing? Was anything what they thought? Uh, so, in, in the end, I guess, my story is more confusing than, than ever. Uh, so, people ask me, what do I, th what, what do I think of Mac? Um, and I try to keep my judgments out of the book um, so as not to color the reporting and sort of let the, the facts speak for themselves. But I say that Mac embarked on Joseph Campbell's mythic journey, hero's journey, a call to adventure uh, that Mac tries to evade at first, like all heroes, uh, a summons that tests his resolve, uh, dangerous uh, adventures, um, and the final triumph of returning with a boon for mankind, which is this, this knowledge, this information, and a tale to tell around the, the firelight or the digital firelight. Um, and as I say at the end of the book, it's what, it's what heroes do, it's what human beings do. Uh, and I call Mac the believer, not because he was gullible, but because he believed in creating a better world, and he believed in the power and genius of the human spirit. So one last thing. Uh, in late night in 2017, I was feverishly working on the book. 
uh, when I got a call from my friend Leslie, uh, who I'd gotten to know from my research. And Leslie was the last companion of Bud Hopkins, and she'd written a terrific book of her own, uh, the, uh, UFOs, General Pilots, and uh, Ofic Government Officials Go on the Record, talking about actual UFO uh, experiences that they document. Leslie told me then that she had just got back from Washington, where she learned that the Pentagon had a secret unit investigating UFO encounters with military jets, and this was more than a half a century after the government closed the book, Project Blue Book, uh, on UFOs, claiming that there's nothing to see here, folks. Um, and um, not only was there this uh, agency that no one knew existed, uh, existing in Washington, um, it's called ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, one of its many names. It had some secret names. But um, the head of it, Lou Elizondo, had just submitted his letter of resignation to Defense Secretary Mattis because he wasn't getting enough support. This was a great story. Um, and uh, not only that, but Leslie had the story on the record from participants in the, co in the, in the meeting. And we checked uh, Lou Elizondo's military records, and he was who he said he was. And um, I still had good contacts at the Times, so I um, emailed Executive Editor Dean Baquet, um, and I headed the email, important story to offer. I didn't want to give him too many details, um, but I, I pitched it uh, saying it was a sensational and confidential time-sensitive story about a highly secret program involving national security and a race for ultra-high technology that could transform the planet. If that didn't get him, <laughs> uh, a terrific editor that he was, he did go for it. Uh, he was immediately interested, and he put us in touch with uh, the Washington Bureau and Washington editors, <coughs> and we teamed up with the Pentagon correspondent, Helene Cooper, who had excellent sources in the military, and she flew out to interview Harry Reid, um, who, who was then... Um, uh, let's see, was, he was still the, uh, who actually as Senate Majority Leader, I don't know whether he still was then, but as Senate Majority Leader, he had secured $22 million in black secret funding for ATIP. And uh, she got an interview with him where he confirmed the, the, the entire story. Um, so our story appeared on the front page on um, December 17th, 2017. Um with extraordinary Navy videos of uh, some of the encounters. Uh, they remain the most watched, or close to the most watched videos ever put out by the New York Times, and they show up in every story about UFOs, whether they have to deal with the New York Times story or not. Um, anyway, I'm happy to say they really moved the needle. Uh, they made uh, UFOs uh, safe for mainstream media to cover. Um, and we followed up with a few other stories on near misses, on uh, pilot accounts of things they'd seen, including a UFO uh, under the water, apparently, which was pretty sensational. And um, a final story about, um, and the most difficult to get, about briefings to Congress um, about apparent or possible recoveries of crashed UFOs. Um, and there were complaints, particularly with the last story, that we were holding back information, but uh, we only reported what we were able to confirm. Um, and I'm happy to say that the Defense Department now has changed its tune. Uh, it's encouraging airmen and sailors to come forward with UFO stories, um, with sightings. Uh, ATIP supposedly went out of business, uh, but it, um, it's been revived. Um, it was called for a while the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, which Congress mandated to report to the public beginning last year, which it did. Um, and it later became the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office because some of the um, uh, encounters seem to involve traffic underwater, very strange. Um, and a report is now overdue, as many people of this field know. Uh, that the latest report should have been in a few weeks ago. It's some, something is holding it up. And uh, are Leslie and I working on new stories? You bet we are. Are we going to talk about them? No. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's it, folks. Thank you very much. <laughs>